Hang on. You just... I slightly... I slightly broke my hand broke by my punching hand. an electric wow. box. Yeah. Jace Lindgren. Yikes. Yeah. Well, there it is. <laughs> if you're happy with the same old ways of dating... If you enjoy sucking at communication... And you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships... Broaden your sexual horizons... Develop a better understanding of yourself... Or learn more about non-monogamy... Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. Bye. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are angry. We're angry that too many people are using their anger in ways that are unhealthy, repressive, and destructive. And we're also angry that people are repressing their anger and it's affecting their health negatively. This week, we're going to talk about ways that your anger can be a force for good in your life and in your relationships, as well as how to do that. <laughs> You sound very angry, Jace. I'm so angry. Can you tell? I just like how, how it was like normal initially, and then it kind of <laughs> it, it got angrier a little bit, <laughs> and you're like, we're angry. Yeah. <laughs> it was good, though. It was good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So anger. What a topic. Um, I do feel like what I've noticed in at least like kind of the cultural zeitgeist of the internet has been more of this narrative around everyone kind of being a lot angrier in the past couple of years. I, I feel yeah. like probably attached to election cycle and, uh, you know, political goings on, but beyond that as well, it seems like there's a lot of people who are angry, just kind of at the state of the world in general. Um, however, I do feel that when it comes to how we deal with anger in our personal lives and in our personal relationships, there's still some places where we tend to get stuck. Um, and I think especially mm. getting stuck on like, is anger good or not? Is anger bad for us? Should we be angry? Should we not? It feels exhausting to be angry sometimes, but also I feel like being irresponsible if I'm not angry about certain things. Um, these are just like a lot of things that I've noticed. So a few weeks ago, I just kind of on a, not necessarily a whim, but like a kind of as an experiment decided to try holding like a trauma and PTSD informed polyamory processing group um, that I invited a number of our patrons to just to kind of try and see how it would feel and, and what would happen and if people would get something out of it. And I noticed for me when I was taking part in the processing group that at least my experience of it is it felt like the discussion didn't really take off for me or become super engaging for me until we kind of started acknowledging how angry a lot of us were. <laughs> um, or acknowledging, you know, some people brought up the fact that they had difficulty even allowing themselves to feel angry in the first place, and maybe even to a point where they weren't even sure what felt like anger and what was sadness or what was frustration or what was something different. Um, and I noticed a lot of people also expressed feeling confused, and including myself, like feeling this confusion about how to feel anger and then also express it in a way that's not going to hurt someone else. Um, and because of that, kind of in the absence of having these clear roadmaps or clear scripts or strategies for expressing anger in a healthy way, um, a lot of people talked about that they would just bottle it up or just kind of clam up or downplay it until the feeling passed, which I've definitely done a kajillion times in my life. Um, and which is a tendency that, as we'll talk about later on in the episode, is actually not great for your health <laughs> um, and also not great for your relationships. And so that was my inspiration in putting this episode together is I wanted to talk about ways to acknowledge and embrace anger and talk about people's different experiences of anger and then also, you know, strategies for being able to express it in a way that doesn't cause harm or destruction. I feel like there are moments in life where one might ask themselves, like, I, I I feel as though I should be potentially angry at the situation that I was dealt or, you know, mm. certain things in life uh, that are unjust to me. And therefore, like, I should be really angry about it. But it is very easy to just kind of like go along and realize like that you have bottled that up for a very long time and not really done anything about it. So it is interesting to try to 
to like parse through like how to effectively manage that anger or that uh, really bottled up emotion inside you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I felt like this was a very cool episode to do and I'm glad that you brought it to us. Yeah. I, it reminds me of uh, something that I read years and years ago about um, <clears throat> I'm blanking on his first name, but Maslow, the psychologist mm-hmm. who was kind of one of the first people to ever study what do healthy people look like instead of just Mm. studying people who have some sort of clear kind of mental illness or, you know, something that's wrong that they're trying to fix. And instead being like, well, what are we trying to get people to? What do, what do healthy, well-adjusted people look like? And he was kind of one of the first people to study that. And I remember reading about this years ago and that one of the traits was, um, getting really angry about injustice in the world. Huh, interesting. Uh, and I, I remember at the time being really struck with the idea that anger would be a trait of a healthy person. Because uh, mm-hmm. at the time, you know, as a, I think I was in high school or something, like that had never occurred to me, right? Anger had always, you know, I'd always thought of it as a negative thing, right? That a healthy person just would never be bothered by anything, wouldn't be upset by anything. Um, but that, yeah, actually that, that being angry... In this case, it was specifically over injustice. Um, but, but yeah, I thought that was, that was really interesting. And it's something I've thought a lot about over the years since then uh, of kind of remembering that and being like, huh, you're right. Like that is okay. And maybe even good to feel that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like everyone, you know, everyone has a different personal relationship with how anger comes up in their life or how anger comes up in their body or how they feel it. I know that for me, um, I don't know. I I had this like weird kind of crisis of identity, like for a number of years where like, it wasn't until I was in my twenties that suddenly like my mom and my sister mentioned to me that they both felt that I was a very angry child. And I remember being like, huh, that's weird. Like I don't evaluate my childhood that way. Like I don't necessarily like, I don't necessarily remember being angry, but, but then over time, as I kind of started thinking about it, I realized like, no, I don't think that I was necessarily like an outwardly angry child, but I think I definitely was like a super bottled up angry child. Like, and I think it was more of that, that I think maybe was more destructive when I was small was, was that was less of like being outwardly expressively angry and more of like that kind of suppressing and, and bottling kind of habit that I think a lot of us get into. Um, something that like my own therapist pointed out was that anger is one of the first emotions that we get shamed out of as a child. Um, depending on context, like some people that's not the case, but with a lot of us, like anger and outward expressions of anger, kind of the first thing that get disciplined or, or get shamed out of us essentially. And so we kind of carry that into our adulthoods, often feeling like anger itself as an emotion is a bad thing. Kind of like what you said, Jason, assuming that a healthy person just wouldn't feel angry or wouldn't allow themselves to feel angry. Yeah. It's surprising that your family characterized you as that, even though you were like keeping it bottled up and inward, that they could still like see it. Well, and, I, and that, that, yeah, we, that, yeah, exactly. that we are able to see that in other people and characterize it as being angry, even though we ourselves are trying to bottle it up. Right, right, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's the thing is that like when you bottle it up, like it it comes out somehow, right? (laughs) Right. Like it finds a way to come out somehow. What about the two of you? What have been like your personal experiences or like relationships with anger in your lives? Oh boy. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I definitely know that like uh, anger was like not something that I was allowed to be in my opinion growing up and not something that I was like, that I did very often at all. Like definitely I know it's very difficult for me to express uh, any anger or like sense of injustice towards um, like older female authoritative women because Mm -hmm. that's what my mother was and Mm -hmm. I wasn't able, I just, I didn't, I I didn't develop, I think good ways of being uh, angry or like standing up for myself in those types of situations but to some men, I feel like I'm really good at like expressing myself to some <laughs> men, although I definitely will default to like sadness or frustration in myself rather than like outward anger towards someone else or towards a situation that is maybe unjust. Right. Like over my father not being in my life, like that's more just sadness, I think. Mm, right. Yeah, that makes sense. 
What about you, Jace? Um, for me, it's it's interesting because something that that we talked about while we were kind of preparing this episode is the sort of gender differences and how anger is treated for boys and girls yeah. growing up and kind of what we're taught is okay or not. And, you know, there's this cultural thing where women aren't allowed to be angry, that, you know, anger is unattractive. Um, whereas on the other hand, you know, men aren't allowed to be sad. And so it's like, we can, we can be angry, but we're not allowed to be sad or, or afraid, I guess. And so mm -hmm. both of those have to get kind of like sublimated into anger. Um, so, so I think that was definitely at work culturally, but at the same time, actually, like in my family growing up, um, especially in my kind of like early tween and teen years, um, anger was very not allowed in my house. Mm. Like that was like immediately like, no, like that's not a thing you're allowed to do. Um, and so <clears throat> I don't know. So I feel like I have this sort of weird mix of like a lot of that time in my life, which if, if y'all remember, it's a pretty angry time in a child's what, life. As, as a teenager that, or a tween? Like tweens to teens, right? Mm. Like, um, uh, you know, and we had just like had to move and my parents had gotten divorced and like all this stuff that I was angry about as a kid, um, and that kind of wasn't allowed to be expressed. So there was a lot of that repression of it yet. On the other hand, um, I, I was angry and for me, it would end up coming out in sort of like explosions mm -hmm. of just getting really angry over a video game I was playing, right? Or over something that happened and like punching a wall or, you know, it, it, it would kind of have to get expressed physically, um, usually in a way that, that hurt me somehow, right? Like punching a wall or something that would kind of hurt your hand. I think I actually broke my hand once, Jeez. Uh, just very slightly. I didn't, didn't go to a doctor or anything about it, but um, punching like, an electrical box. Broke my hand. Hang on, you just very I slightly, slightly. I slightly broke my hand slightly broke by my punching hand. an electrical wow. box. Yeah. Jace Lindgren. <laughs> yeah. Well, there it is. Um, yeah. So, which is not. Uh, I mean, even just on the surface level, we can go. That's not a healthy expression of anger because you hurt yourself. Um, yeah. But yeah, and, th and that for me took a long time to to get away from that. And that I still like that, that sometimes like that, that urge to like hit something if I'm feeling angry um, is, is still there. Cause that, I guess being like physical in my manifestation of anger was a way that was okay, hmm. I guess. Whereas, you know, just like expressing my feelings wasn't as much maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm psychoanalyzing well, myself. That's the kind of thing. I feel like <laughs> the common thread in like all these stories is that it seems like in our childhoods, there was definitely this conflation of like anger, the emotion with like anger, the like physical expression of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, let's say something like punching a wall or like yelling or, or throwing something or something like that, that it's like, if you're, if the parenting is, you know, don't do this thing of like punching the wall or yelling or throwing a book, whether that's intentional or not, it seems like the message received can be, oh, anger is just not okay. Mm. You know, feeling this way is just not okay. I mentioned yeah, the throwing yeah. the book because like one of the times I got in the most trouble in my life was because I tried to throw a book at my sister when I was angry. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, Yikes. Yeah. And if, for some reason, I uh, feel like it was more about the preciousness of books than about like the anger, yeah. but, or maybe a combination <laughs> of the two. I don't know, but I never threw a book again. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Goodness. Well, yeah. And anger also, um, it's experienced in different ways and we have a lot of unfortunately like stereotypes surrounding anger mm -hmm. in in society just in general not just with men and women but also people of color like even like the spicy latino right. or latina person um you know unfortunately like an angry woman might be like a shrill or bitchy or delegitimized or you know thought of as crazy whereas like an angry white man might be taken seriously and might be thought of as like very inspiring or very passionate. And then obviously, yeah, there, are, you know, is that awful stereotype of like the angry black person, mm -hmm. which is, you know, terrible and bullshit. 
Um, and all of these, unfortunately, are things I think that in our society we do tend to think of right away when we think of anger or when we try to look at anger and someone attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes maybe one's mind might go to that as opposed to like, how is this being expressed? And do is it something that I need to listen to because this person is in pain or they need to express themselves in a certain way? Yeah, I think it's interesting because it is, it's, you know, we have, we give different consequences for different groups of people when they feel angry. And personally, I don't know, maybe this sounds like a tiny bit of a conspiracy theory, but I think there's some truth to it. Like, I think the reason for that is because anger is a powerful thing. Like, yeah. Even on a very, like, let's just talk total surface level out of control anger where you do feel like you want to hit something like, like that's a powerful manifestation, right? Like that's intimidation and that's domination. And so it's like anger itself has this power to it um, where maybe even in a healthy way, it's just being able to be assertive or to stand up for yourself or something like that. And so I suspect that that's why we kind of have all these double standards is because people that routinely have been marginalized it's like, well, we can't let their anger actually be powerful. You know, yeah. we can't let a woman's anger actually be powerful. So we have to write it off as like, oh, she's mentally ill or or she's being bitchy or or she's just getting herself worked up over something that's not actually a huge deal. Um, or, yeah, with anyone who's a person of color, like we have to delegitimize the anger. We can't let it be powerful. But like usually with like a white cis man, then it's then it can be read as oh, like passionate or inspired or motivated. Like, I think that's the reasoning behind it, but I'm sure there's many other reasons why as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think something too for, for men and something that's been an interesting process of learning in my life is that um, sort of the physicality of anger. um, For me, I just in general experience all of my emotions pretty physically. Like I'm just that sort of tactile kinetic kind of person. Um, But something that was interesting is that for me, my perception of myself being angry or like punching walls or whatever is that in my head, I'm still the like scrawny little nerdy kid that I was as a child, right? That, that with your Coke bottle glasses with my, had real big glasses that were super thick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, right. Mm-hmm. And I was a very skinny little kid. Um, and I was pretty, pretty skinny and unimposing for most of my young life. Uh, and then, you know, a, a few years ago, I guess like 10 years ago or so, like got into, to working out and I'm now a much larger human being <laughs> than I was back then. And, I had this kind of repeatedly shocking realization that my anger was scary to people Mm. in a way that I had never perceived it myself. Um, Specifically scary to women that I'm, that I'm with to partners that it not, not even being like at, at all physically aggressive toward them, but just the sheer like physicality of my anger, especially if it's directed at them, you know, in a argument or something we're having or in punching a wall or something that that's really scary for someone else was something that had never even occurred to me. And I think for a lot of men, they don't realize that Mm. like they don't realize that we associate anger with being out of control, especially when it seems like it is out of control. And even if you're physically on you know, equal footing with someone in terms of your size and your muscle mass and things like that, that's still a very scary thing that this person could be out of control and not be able to stop them from hurting me physically or trying to. Uh, And to then amplify that if the person is smaller in size than you are, Mm -hmm. right? Like how serious that is. And I think a lot of men don't get that. Um, And that we're, we're almost shown the opposite that that should be an attractive trait of, mm. of being sort of physically angry. Cause like our action heroes are physically angry, right? Like they take out that anger in a physical way against the bad guys. And then all of the women are like, wow, he's so great. We love this. Well, there's always, I feel like in a lot of action movies, there's that moment like, you know, when the male action hero has usually has like lost, like, the female protagonist in some way, right. Or the love interest or whoever it is, like they've died or, or he's failed in some way. And it's like, instead of being sad, he like flips a table. Right. 
That's or, how we know he's sad. Or knock something over. That's how we know. Angry. Exactly. That's yeah. how we know he's upset is yeah. because he's like destroyed something. And we look at that and it's not seen as like, oh, he's out of control. We see it as like, oh, he's so moved and mm. he's so hurt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, the most recent season of Luke Cage, like Luke punches a wall in front of his, uh, his lady love, and <laughs> she like leaves and does mm. not come back mm. the rest of the season. Wow! And like, you do not know if she's coming back ever, especially now that apparently the season or yeah, Luke Cage is like gone away from Netflix and is going on the the Disney like streaming thing or whatever. <laughs> I see, but. It was really interesting. He, and pun- he punched them right off of Netflix. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, it, I I don't know. Like, parts of that potentially felt problematic, but also like I I felt like wow, okay, they're showing like the consequences of this man being really angry and mm-hmm. manifesting his anger in a way not directed necessarily towards her, but towards something else that's an an inanimate object, but yet she felt very threatened by that and chose to leave. And even though he's the protagonist and that was very interesting to Mm. me to see that. But I think, uh, I think an important message potentially to, to show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, I think that is really important because I think like you were saying, Jace, I do think a lot of people don't realize, like you kind of think like, well, me like throwing this thing or hitting the wall or whatever, like I'm not, hurting someone you know Mm -hmm. i'm just trying to get my anger out but like it still has these consequences you know um yeah but i want to kind of shift focus a little bit because i want this episode to be about like the good things that anger can actually bring into our lives and can actually do for us because i think that's the thing is like we're so used to having all these negative memories and negative associations with expressions of anger And that then gets translated into, oh, anger itself is really bad and I need to avoid it. And so I need to repress it. And then it comes out and then it becomes like this just, you know, continually perpetuating cycle. Um, But I would like to take a moment to talk about what are the good things that some healthy expressions and manifestations of anger can do for us. Yeah. So initially, um, when you feel anger within your body and within yourself, it is like this personal sort of red flag that indicates when a boundary might have been crossed or when something might be encroached on uh, that you feel is like not okay. So it's a good indicator for us just to say like, hey, like this, you know, lights something up within me. Like I realize that maybe something is going on here that uh, to me is not okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's also a great opportunity to check in with our core needs and values to see like, hey, am I just like, getting, I don't know, insecure about something here and therefore it's causing me to feel anger or is is a real like core value of mine being encroached on and, you know, what do I need to do about that there? So it does kind of show us that those things might be happening in the moment. Yeah, definitely. I find for myself that I think that anger gives me a reminder to be self-compassionate Um, which sounds totally counterintuitive um, because it's like when you feel angry, usually it's the last thing on your mind to think about being compassionate towards yourself or self-loving. But I recently realized, and I mean, literally just like a couple weeks ago, I just had this sudden flash of realization that the days where I'm feeling the angriest or the most frustrated or the most testy or where I'm being more harsh to like the people around me or angry at the people around me, I suddenly made this realization that there's this correlation that the days that I'm doing that also happen to be days that I'm also being like really harsh toward myself and like really yeah, angry. That's really interesting. Yeah. And really angry toward myself. And I kind of realized like, Oh, it's like the same level of harshness that I hold toward myself. I'm also expressing to other people. And so it feels like they must be related in some way. Um, and, uh, even before I made that particular realization, I, I kind of started to try to take this different tactic for the times that I would get angry instead of feeling ashamed or feeling like I needed to not feel it or feeling like I needed to ignore it. Um, I kind of started thinking about myself as an angry toddler, essentially, or I'd mm. kind of bring to mind images of myself as a toddler being angry because seeing a, honestly any toddler get angry it's it's not necessarily scary, right? Maybe it's annoying, like hearing right. a toddler give a tantrum, <laughs> but you're not personally like scared or feel like this no. toddler's going to cause you any harm. It's just like, oh, she's throwing a temper tantrum. And 
So I kind of started looking at myself that way or like kind of speaking to the part of me that felt angry as though it was like my three-year-old self that I was just kind of soothing and just saying like, hey, it's going to be okay. I know you're angry, but it's going to pass and it's going to be okay. And doing that helped me to kind of take a little bit of a different approach that kind of helped me actually get through the anger a little bit faster when it was more like that of like kind of validating and being compassionate and being gentle like you would with like an angry baby, essentially. Yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another good thing about anger is that it can sort of fuel us and enable us to communicate about our needs or our values or our beliefs assertively. Um, it also can really fuel putting energy into something that does matter of making social change. Um, Examples that came up a lot when we were researching this is things like the civil rights movement in the U S and the women's suffrage movement, Mm. that both of those were very fueled by anger justifiably. And that is what kind of helped keep people motivated, give them the courage to do something about it. um, And to, you know, like this, assert your, communicate your needs and your values uh, that anger was a very useful thing and was used in, you know, ultimately very healthy ways in those instances of making social change. Um, Like we read about one example of um, on a more individual scale, right? If you're angry about people constantly running a stop sign or a stoplight at an intersection near your house. And it makes you angry because you're worried about the safety of your kids or, you know, people in the neighborhood, you like an unhealthy expression of that is either to just be angry and repress it or to sit there and, you know, yell or like throw rocks at cars that drive (laughs) through the intersection. But a healthy expression of that is to take that anger and be like, I'm going to go contact you know, my local police department or local legislature and try to do something about this. Like, is there something we can actually do to stop this, which could then have a positive impact on your neighborhood by making it a safer place, right? So even on an individual scale, um, that that same thing can happen where it can be used to really fuel something good. Yeah. Let me tell you, it's a really good cure for writer's block also. I know you're always, really? she's always encouraging me when I'm trying to write stuff and feeling like I can't. She's like, here, read Just this. Kidding. And she'll, she'll send me an article that she, that's written about polyamory or about masculinity that she knows is going to make me angry. <laughs> She's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. It's true though. I mean, I mean, like when I was writing my book, it's not that the entire process was fueled by anger, but it's like the inspiration for sitting down to start to write an outline was being angry about the ways that I was reading like relationship advice written for women, Mm. like, like flipping through Cosmo and I was like physically ill and so angry about all these stereotypes and all these assumptions and all these really unhealthy things being pushed on people that I was like, fuck this. Like I'm going to write something better. And it did. And like, I, I, you know, I will tell you that if you're experiencing some kind of writer's block, like I feel like that's one of the best ways for it is like find something that you're angry about. Um, and Ideally, start that's about related that. to the thing you want to write about. It, right? I don't know. It doesn't have to sometimes, yeah. cause sometimes I find no, even, I mean, yeah, even if I'm just able to like get the juices flowing and like huh. write something that sometimes that helps to get some momentum to kind of keep writing about even something else, even if it's not necessarily the topic that I'm angry about. Wow. Yeah. I remember I was really angry about Brad. Mm-hmm. That Like once upon a time and I went to yoga like seven days in a row or something, <laughs> just like going and working out constantly. It was good. Yeah. I got some yeah. real good workouts out of Brad as well. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I definitely got some good workouts out of some bad relationships. Yeah. I will say. Like, <laughs> yeah. And it yeah, is ironic sure. because now I'm in these relationships that feel really good. And I'm like, man, I'm only doing yoga like one day a week when I was doing it like seven days a week. And my shoulders were like popping off. Like my arms look so good. <laughs> Those back are then. utopia days too. When exactly. your arms are like free <laughs> right. trunks. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So let's talk about some stits and stats. Some of our favorite things yeah, to talk yeah, about. Of course. Um, Love it. Of course. So there was a 2004 study that was published in motivation and emotion, which is a, a um, like a social, a socio psychology journal. And uh, in the study, they found that the participants, um, they were surveying and like studying specifically people who were in relationship and who were communicating their anger within their relationships. Um, And they found that when, you know, the participants were able to kind of describe their anger in a controlled way um, to their partner, 
like both members of the couple found that it was really the anger itself was a really illuminating force as in like, oh, this anger, whether it was experienced by both of us or one of us, it highlighted areas that we needed to work on. But it didn't just do that, like it highlighted both like our faults and like kind of our pitfalls, but it also highlighted what we're good at, what our strengths are. And they found that ultimately, like their takeaway was that getting angry and letting themselves feel angry ultimately led to making positive changes in the relationship. Um, So again, it's kind of that same thing that it's like your anger can be this indicator of like, ooh, something that I don't really like is going on or something needs to change here. And if you can find a way to kind of express that um, in a productive direction, that then it can produce these much more positive results in like maybe making the change that actually is going to help you in the future. That's great. Yeah. So another study was from the Journal of Family Communication, and it found that couples who express their anger productively are likely to live longer than couples who suppress their anger. Hmm. So I think that makes sense. Like there's a lot of talk recently and, I don't know, within at least the last 10, 15 years about like the mind body connection and Mm. just how obviously, you know, modern medicine isn't the only thing that is going to make you disease free. Mm. You also have to do things from within and, and be, you know, as peaceful, I think, on the inside as you can be. And that also is uh, a manifestation of healthily being angry when you can. And Mm. so that makes sense that like, if you're just constantly suppressing your anger and bottling it up towards your spouse, then you're not going to be a very healthy person, perhaps as life continues on with that person. So yeah. And and also, I mean, you can better, I think, have uh, better arguments and disagreements (laughs) with your spouse if you can, you know, talk about your anger in a productive way. Right. Well, I feel like we were reading some other studies recently that was, what was it? It was just so obvious. I was so just obvious. about to talk about Yeah, where it yeah. was just like they found that people who like directly communicated actually got what they wanted in their relationships, <laughs> you know? Oh, right, right, right. That yeah, one, yeah. Like a, what with, a with concept. The, I know, with asking for support. Um, right, right. But I feel like there's kind of been this bigger thing of, I feel like we've kind of... I want to say we've been fed this lie and that sounds really dramatic, but, but it's kind of like we've bought into this story that, that anger itself is physically bad for you. That mm. like angry people are the ones who experience like the heart disease and stress and blood pressure issues. But I think it really is tied more to it's the suppression. It's the fighting yeah. against the anger that it is like what gets kind of trapped in your body. And it ultimately yeah. has those negative health effects for you. Yeah, there's, gosh, I mean, this is such a fascinating subject to look for studies on, to like Google this and stuff. Um, So just like one thing was uh, an old study um, about like type A personalities, and it was showing that the type A personality, which was originally associated with like heart disease and other sort of health, health problems because of the high levels of stress and anger and things like that. That Interesting. in studying it more, uh, it was found that actually like things like work addiction and um, uh, like competitiveness are actually not clearly linked to health problems. However, being overly suspicious of other people and quick to uh, like get really angry mm-hmm. over things that other people do or things you suspect people are doing was tied to higher risk of heart disease as well as other things. Mm-hmm. Um there was that other one we read about. There was this study done over the course of 18 years from like the seventies to the eighties of <clears throat> studying men and women about different situations, like giving them different situations and asking, would you be angry about this? And then would you say something about it or would you just kind of bottle it up basically? And then they came back to those people 18 years later and found specifically Jeez. that with women, the ones who said that they would be angry in situations, but would not say anything about it were three times more likely to be dead 18 years later. (laughs) Right. That's horrifying. What? Good Lord. Yeah. No, there's some bonkers studies out there. Um, But this other one more recently that, that I thought was interesting was uh, from UC Santa Barbara moons and Mackie, which I just love saying their name (laughs) uh, did a study in 2007 moons and Mackie. Mackie. (laughs) That sounds like someone that might be in Santa Barbara. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These are two two people. These are their last names. Oh, okay. So, did two people. In Moons, Santa Barbara. Moons and Mackie uh, did this study in 2007 that showed 
that angrier people were better able to distinguish between strong and weak arguments that they were reading. Huh, so they, they did this by having people uh, write down or recollect a, a memory that, that made them angry. And then oh. kind of through some questions, like verified that they were actually feeling angry uh, and then presented them with these two different arguments. One that's like actually citing studies and things like that. And then the other one arguing the same point, but just using all sort of anecdotal things or unsupported observations, things like that. And they found that the angrier people were better able to identify sort of the weaknesses in the weak argument huh. and that this one was better. And they did the study again, this time where the difference was in who the argument was supposedly written by. In that one case, it was written by, you know, a, a board of researchers on this topic. And in the other one, it was written by some uh, like medical practitioners in a field totally unrelated to the subject. And that again, the angrier people were more likely to identify the source that came from a more reliable source as mm. being more reliable and more compelling. Um, so wow. yeah, really, really interesting that anger can also fuel that, like can fuel, fuel kind of being a little more critical and not so susceptible to someone's argument. Wow. That's so interesting. I mean, that seems like that's a really good thing because I feel like we definitely need more critical thinking in our lives. Right. I think all of us do. I think that's generally a good thing. Um, at the same time, I could see that, that, you know, kind of increased critical thinking skill, uh, making you also more critical of a partner's argument as well, mm -hmm. which is maybe a good <laughs> thing, maybe a bad thing. I don't know. Sometimes logic is not, you know, like logical debate is not always the thing that solves arguments in relationships right. I found, but sometimes sure. it is. I don't know. Um, yeah. It is, seems it like is the jury's out on that. Yeah. I'd be yeah. curious about that. Well, it makes me think about that, that earlier study you mentioned um, about couples identifying that healthfully expressed anger helped them resolve things better. So maybe there is something to it that it, if, if both people are able to bring that in a healthy way, that it helps your critical thinking together as a unit, not just yeah. at tearing each other down. I don't know. I like that. I like that theory. Do you think that being angry could help you be more critical of your own bullshit arguments? Maybe. Cause I that wonder. <laughs> Huh. That I'm not sure. Let's put that study See, together. <laughs> yeah, I feel like when you're angry, it can be kind of like a kind of self-perpetuating, yeah. like yeah. cyclical thing. Yeah. So it's good if you're able to like be angry, have that emotion, and then walk away from it and like think more globally afterwards. I don't know. Right. Which maybe not. No, no, no. I You're like totally that. on the right track because in our second part of this episode, we are going to be getting specifically yes. into that about, you know, tools and techniques for handling your anger well and for expressing it in a healthy way, in, in an illuminating way, as they described in the study. Yes. Yeah. All right, y'all. Are you ready for some tools, some techniques, some stuff that we can actually do with our anger other than just feeling the it anger. and then not denying it, yeah. which is, I think, normally our MO, or at least my it. MO. Um, so we're going to start out and I'm going to introduce you to this great acronym that I found. Um, I did not come up with this. I wish that I did. Um, I found this specifically in an article that was on the Montana State University, I think, psych department website. Uh, I could not find this acronym referenced anywhere else um, in common usage. So I assume maybe they're the ones who came up with it. I don't know. Um, but I thought it was really useful, really interesting way of thinking about dealing with anger. And so basically, if the situation is let's say you're at home, something happens, uh, like your partner. Okay. What usually happens in my life is that my partners put something in a place that it does not belong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and or then I, someone's loaded the dishwasher poorly. Oh gosh. Jace. Okay. Yeah. Jace's situation. Someone's loaded the dishwasher poorly. Um, maybe your partner said something to you in passing that kind of hurt or, okay, whatever. Something's happened where you're feeling angry. And so you're going to use the acronym area, a-R-E-A. -E yes. And that stands for Admit, Restraint, Express, Action Plan. So you're going to start out by admitting that you're angry in the first place, um, which yes. I think is really important because it's, you know, that's kind of the first step because otherwise it's it's stuffing it, it's repressing it, it's denying it, it's claiming that it's maybe something else entirely instead of just admitting, hey, what I'm feeling right now is anger and that's okay. So you're going to... there are warning signs. Exactly. Um... So I, I don't know how, what's the best way to go through this? Because we kind of came up with like tips and tricks for every single stage of this. Maybe it's the best way to go through it that way. Uh, well, why don't we talk about them just briefly first, and then we'll go through the tools for each okay. one. So yeah, so you're going to admit your anger, um, restrain your anger. And I really want to 
emphasize that this R is restrain and not repress. <laughs> I was just going to um, say that, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's different. So repress is, you know, shoving it down, bottling it, not expressing it, not doing anything about it until inevitably explodes at some later date. Um, restrain is a little different. The nuance of restrain is the idea that before you express your anger, you get it under control. So you do what you need to do to to get yourself in a place where you're not going to be like yelling or you're not going to be like, you know, you know, punching a wall or something like that, or you're not going to be straight up attack mode on your partner, but that you're still able to, you know, to express it in a more calm way, even if you're still feeling angry. Which is the third part is to express. Which is the third one, which is to actually express in a healthy way. And then the last one is an action plan. And we love action plans because they're part of our radar, um, you know, coming up with action points, but it doesn't have to be part of a radar. It can be part of when you go through this, when you're able to actually express your anger, that then it can be a productive conversation with your partner about like, oh, okay, let's come up with something actionable that we can both agree to that will maybe help prevent this negative feeling in the future. Um, But let's kind of go through these again, these, you know, the A-R-E-A, but with kind of some more specific strategies for helping that to actually happen. Well, should I go through the signs of admitting? There's so many signs. So many signs. (laughs) Yeah, so these are like like the clues. And I think it it seems like, you would think it would be obvious to just go like, Oh, I'm angry right now. But I feel like when we're actually feeling angry, sometimes it's easy to not even realize we are. What is going on right now? I'm just like feeling not good. And then there's a bunch of reasons or, well, there's a bunch of things that you should look out for. Well, I've also, can I I go down the list? Well, before you launch into the list, I just wanted to clarify, like I've also spoken specifically to like a lot of women. There's like a lot of women that I know that have expressed like, I don't even know what my relationship to anger is because mm. I don't I don't know if I've ever actually felt it and and I feel like with a lot of people it's because it's kind of the same thing that women's anger often gets diverted as something else entirely yeah. you know um and so that's why I think it's important to go through a list like this is so that you can have these little clues um to kind of indicate to you like oh I might be feeling angry right now Yes all right so here are the signs So the first one is going to be blood pressure, pulse racing, and then like feeling hot or flushed, Mm -hmm. a stomach ache or a headache. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. Tightness in the chest. Yes. Yeah. I get that Uh, one all the time. Yeah. Clenching your jaw or grinding your teeth. What if you grind your teeth at night? Does that mean you're always angry? <laughs> I'm always angry while I sleep, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ditto. Yeah. So those are like uh, physical symptoms to look out for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then these next ones are like if you catch yourself Man, doing these it, behaviors, yeah. it might be a clue. Mm-hmm. Okay. So rubbing your head, like, uh, like <laughs> no, I think it's like the forehead know. rub. You know, the like, oh, oh okay. I'm so for angry. Me, I'm yeah, pinching my forehead. For me, it tends to be like a temple rub. Uh, I've seen that. Yeah, move. I've seen <laughs> you do that. I've <laughs> yeah. seen you do that. Yep. <laughs> also, uh, <clears throat> this one is interesting. Cupping your fist with your other hand, like, like. What? Yeah, I think cupping? it's it's like cupping. Like if if you're watching the video, you can see it, but it's that kind of like not even like you're you know punching yeah. your hand, but just like you're holding your I fist see. inside your right. hand, like yeah. cl- clenching your fists in some particular way. Yeah, yeah. it's like a variation okay. on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But cupping is a funny way of putting it. Okay, <laughs> pacing. Yeah, pacing around the block, mm-hmm. uh, getting sarcastic. Wow. Well, what if you're just sarcastic in general? Like what then? I feel like this one. This one kind of goes on to ties to the next one, which is acting in an abusive or abrasive manner. But I feel well, like it's when you notice you're starting to like respond very sarcastically in mm-hmm. a way that's kind of mean, like in a yeah, way that's, that's true. That's well, you know, there's like fun sarcasm and hurtful sarcasm. <laughs> it's like sure, that. absolutely. Well, and then also it says losing your sense <clears throat> of humor, mm-hmm. which is really yeah that that definitely is a. A big yeah. telltale sign, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, as you said, acting in an abusive or abrasive manner, craving a drink or smoke or other substances that relax you. Yeah. Definitely been guilty of that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Raising your voice, of course. Yeah. And then beginning to yell, scream, or cry. Huh. Mm-hmm. I love that cry is on that list because yeah, that's I, surprising. It's something that I remember. Like Emily, you kind of mentioned this earlier on, and I remember you and I having conversations years ago 
where something would be coming up that, that you were angry about and you would start crying. And oh the assumption could be like, oh, I'm sad about this thing. Right. But I, I think it's worth noting here that like, no, that can also be a symptom of anger, especially if yeah. anger wasn't something you were allowed to express, that it very likely yeah, could just, show up as crying. Yeah, it just manifests itself in yeah. crying. Yeah, 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 I think that's really <laughs> and common. And frustration. Yes, it's really common, I think, with like, people who are socialized to be women, you know, it's this idea that again, like crying is acceptable for people who are women <laughs> to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so often yeah. like when that angry emotion comes up, it comes out as crying, but it is kind of that same thing where it's like, Oh, well, if I start to cry, like if I start to express this anger, I'm going to start crying, which means I'm going to be seen as like out of control or sad or like mm. all these things. I'm not actually when it's actually about my anger, which I think is another thing that often holds people back from expressing their anger is because they know they're going to cry at the same time. Yeah. Um, like actually in a book that I was reading recently, they talked about the fact that like per particularly with women in positions of power in a workplace, for instance, that mm. like a male boss, for instance, if he gets angry and kind of starts right. yelling, like that's okay. But if she gets angry and starts crying, that's an entirely like different image yeah. and much more likely to be labeled as like, Oh, she's too emotional or things are falling mm. apart for her or, right. or whatever, you know, that again yeah. kind of keeps people in this cycle of not necessarily wanting to express their anger for fear of not wanting to cry in front of people or at work. Yeah. 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 So <clears throat> with all of these they can be clues of like how to realize you're angry, even when you might not like, like Dedeker was pointing out. And that leads us to the second know. part, which is about restraining that anger. And we've talked about this before, like in our um, uh, five ways to suck less at communication, I believe is where we first talked about this, uh, but it's the idea of halt or as we've, it's now become halt. <laughs> um, so the original halt means hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that if you're any of those things having a discussion or an argument, just stop, fix those things, and then come back and continue the conversation. And we've expanded ours to be horny, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, drunk, or sick. Mm -hmm. So Emily, don't have any serious discussions right now. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting about that is I feel like a lot of those, like, for example, hungry or tired or... Uh, Lonely and is a little bit trickier, mm -hmm. um, but that those are kind of clear. It's like, I'm feeling hungry. Yes. I'm feeling tired. Yes. I'm sick. Yes. But there's others that are kind of on this spectrum, like drunk. It's like, well, uh, I've had a drink or am I too drunk to be mm, having no, this that's conversation? Honestly, that's why I don't list that as drunk. I call it drinking. Drinking? I see, to just, just at clarify, all. To okay, just so that it's sure. not even a qualifier of like, well, I just had two beers. I'm not drunk. You know, it's yeah, just like, no, yeah, yeah. just don't have a, this conversation while you're drinking. I think we also included that to be drugs also. The D mm, is a double purpose. Yeah. Um, so same thing if you're, you know. Double D. I'm too high to have this argument, man. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But things like anger, for example, is harder because it's like, well, we're talking about something that I have a lot of feelings about. Mm. When is this crossing the line from just like, yeah, we're having a serious discussion to being angry. Um, and so I think that identifying those symptoms from before is useful, but I think really getting to calibrate your sort of ability to detect when you've gone into anger mode is a very valuable thing and not something that we're really taught, especially if we're not even taught to recognize anger in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, I think something you pointed out, which tricky with halting is that it's like, if it's, if you realize that it's hunger, you know, you're hangry, mm -hmm. that it's easier to stop because you can realize like, Oh, okay. I think I'm just like, I'm hangry. We need to go get some food. Let's stop and go get food. Yay. We're looking forward to food. You know, um, <laughs> right. when you're tired, it's like, okay, I'm just, I'm way too tired. Like we need to go to sleep. Like let's go to sleep and, and try to revisit this again in the morning. Like, okay, whatever. That's easy. We can just go to sleep. But with anger, I think that's the hardest one to stop. Cause there's not like an external thing, like the need to sleep or the need to eat. That's like, okay, clearly there's this thing that's going to break us out of it. It clearly is like, you need to have the self-determination to, feel angry, but still pause and walk away, which I think, I think is the hardest thing to do. I think I know for me, like I love halt, but like when I am angry, it is so difficult for me to actually halt. Um, yeah. And it definitely it takes yeah. practice. It takes a lot of practice 
when you're actually angry. I think that's the important mm-hmm. thing. It's like it takes practice. Like you have to constantly get yourself to do it while you actually are feeling anger in order to get better at being able to do it. Yeah. So this is something that just will get better with practice. But one way that you could very intentionally go about practicing this is, uh, for example, say this comes up with a, a particular partner, right? That there's maybe, a, especially if there's a certain subject where you tend to get angry and your conversations are less productive, is to go in with your partner with the intention of we're going to halt during this kind of setting that up from the beginning. So it's not like, oh, we failed somehow and we have to halt, but it's like, we're going to halt. We're going to learn how to do this. And evaluating that threshold and being like, as soon as I start to feel like we're going into this, let's halt and let's halt early. Like let's err on the side of halting too early, right? Just to get what that feels like. How do I identify that? And then as you develop your kind of sensitivity to it, you can kind of figure out what the right threshold is for halting. Um, And for you, it may be very early. It may be like, as soon as I start to go here, I have to halt for a little bit so that I can continue this conversation in a productive way. Um, But just kind of going in, knowing you're going to halt can actually be very helpful and very empowering. So it's not seen as a failure. And just as as a last note, um, just remember that it's calling a halt for yourself as opposed to calling a halt for your partner. Um, Because generally, if it's, oh, hey, I need to halt, I need to take a pause, I need to take a break and then come back to this, um, is generally going to be better received than, hey, you need to take a break, you need to halt, Mm. you need to walk away from this. Like, again, the you statements are going to be much more likely to kind of just get you... Defensiveness. Yes, exactly. Get a defensiveness. And I know that I've definitely, you know, experienced that in the past with with, with that. You know, even if it's true, even if a partner is like, you need to halt. And I know in my brain, I'm like, yes, that is correct. But screw you for assuming. Screw you for assuming. Exactly. So, so, uh, so yeah. So just bear that in mind. Um, So that was the restraint. So let's move on to the E, which is express. And so this is. After it's restrained, after it's under control, maybe you've halted, you've taken some time away, you've been able to calm down, and now you can come back to it. Some ways that you can express your anger at the situation or with your partner in a healthy way. Um, It can include things like the old classic, like writing a letter. Um, Specifically, I think a letter you're not going to send is a very useful thing to add to that. Yeah. I find that very valuable for me, at least. Yeah, it doesn't have Have you done that in the past? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so many times. I, I've, I found for me, I actually write like a little journal thing as if huh. I was telling someone else rather than directly to the person. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Kind of like I'm venting to someone, right? but I'm just doing it in writing. Yeah. You know, like I, I just, cool. I'm like, and then they did this and then this and this and this, and I'm so upset about this and I can't believe they would do this, right? Just like getting it out mm-hmm. uh, and not sending yeah. it to anyone. Right. I think when I've when I've used writing as an outlet, it's sometimes been less of a letter and has been more of a like, um, like a combination of getting it on paper with also physically expressing it because it tends to be a lot of like using like a very large red pen and like writing curse, <laughs> curses and like sometimes it's like writing out mean things that I'm feeling, but like mm. once I've written it out, then I don't feel it anymore. And I know I'm not going to say that to the person and I'm not going to send it to the person, but like I've gotten it yeah. out of me. And so now I'm not like scared of my anger and now hurting someone as much. Um, yeah. So definitely encourage people to write, either write a letter, either if you want to address it to the person or to the situation or someone else entirely, or it doesn't even have to be in comprehensible letter format. Just writing out your thoughts and your feelings can be very helpful. Um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, deciding on taking an action that will actually change something productively can be helpful too. Um, and again, this is clarifying from, it's not like taking an action as in, okay, well, this is an action that I can take to get back at this person. Mm. But you know, it can help inspire you to take an action that's actually going to move the situation into somewhere productive. Right now, as we're uh, recording this, it's in the middle of the very historic LA, uh, the school district, like strikes that are occurring. Yeah, it's very rainy here right now. And all the teachers are striking. But obviously, like that, I think manifested out of like frustration and anger over their current predicament. Mm -hmm. And the lack of funding, the giant class sizes, uh, and just, yeah, overall, like, lack of 
funds also for them as teachers, like their salaries are yeah. shit, you know, in yeah. comparison to what they deserve. So they are on strike right now. And I think, yeah, that's a great manifestation and showing that like anger can fuel and bring about good and change for sure. Right, right, right. But that, you know, that was also something that took this process. It wasn't like yeah. angry teachers just kind of on a snap decision decided to walk out of mm. class in the middle of class. No, it's it a was, whole like group right. together, like, you know, thousands and thousands of people striking and choosing to do it as a united front. So right, exactly. That's very exactly. different. No, that's a very yeah. good example. Um, Another way to express it is to, you know, talk or to vent to someone, a friend that you trust who is totally outside the situation, ideally. Um, You know, that's kind of the ideal is either it's a friend um, who you feel like is objective enough outside of your relationship or the situation or whatever, could be a professional, could be a therapist. But again, having this outlet of someone where you can you can just vent and you can just express. Um, I know that often we reference, you know, in the ethical slut, they have their poor baby exercise, um, <laughs> you know, where you can just vent and have a friend just say, oh, poor baby, back to you if you feel like that's going to be helpful, just so you can feel heard. Um, but again, that is kind of diffusing the anger so that it's not going to be unleashed, like on your partner, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the next one, now there's this series of suggestions around things like hit a pillow, you know, or, or go take a golf club to your bed or take a tennis racket to the couch or something like that. And I've seen that, that suggestion come up a lot. Um, it is helpful for some people. There is some research to suggest that doing that doesn't tend to diffuse anger and it's actually more likely to keep you more worked up. Um, which, different people respond to that in different ways. Um, So I feel a little bit hesitant about recommending it as like a go-to. I don't think it's necessarily the best thing to do unless, unless it's like you're going to punch a wall or you're going to punch a person and your last resort is I'm going to punch this pillow, ideally not in front of this person. Um, Mm, But I I will say that like the, the recommendation to like take it out physically on something I feel hesitant about. Um, But I know it does work for some people. It doesn't work for other people. Um, But, but that's, that's just kind of like my takeaway from the whole thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you know, being able to, just verbally express that you are angry in the first place, but expressing it in a calm way can be really helpful. Um, Sometimes I feel like this is a good implementation of like Triforce One, for instance, Mm -hmm. to just tell a partner, hey, Triforce One, I just need you to know, like, I feel really angry about this thing happening. Um, You know, we don't need to talk about it right now, or we don't need to do anything about it right now, or I don't need anything specifically from you, but I just need to be heard. And I just need you to know like that. I am angry. Um, I think even if you are talking about the thing mm, to start mm-hmm. it out by just being like, I like, I need you to know that I'm actually very angry about this thing. I don't want to take that out on you. Um, yeah. But, but like, I need you to know, like I am very angry about this and I really want to find a solution to it can help that person to kind of get it. And for you to feel like your anger is being heard without needing to yeah. yell at them or throw things or, or call them names or, mm-hmm. or whatever you might want to do. Right. Exactly. Otherwise. Yeah, <clears throat> totally. All right. And then the last thing is action points. And this one, um, if you go and listen to our episode on relationship radar, um, we talk a lot about action points being specifically something that's like a tangible, actionable item that you can say either, yes, I did it or no, I didn't do it rather than something amorphous, like let's be better about this or let's do, you know, this more or less. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's do this specific thing at this time, or let's do this X number of times within the week or something. Right. So with these examples of Dedeker being angry about, uh, you know, me putting something in a place where it doesn't (laughs) belong or, or another partner doing that, (laughs) That an example of an action point there is, okay, instead of her just being angry about this, what if we found ways, specific actions both of us could take, right? Like, okay, if you don't want me to put this here, let's get really clear on where this does go. And on the other hand, if you do notice it there, maybe ask me first if there's a reason why it's there, if I'm about to use it again, or write something like that, Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) that... It, it's very specific to the situation. So it's not like we can just give you like, here's the action points you can do. Um, but to really look at what's a very tangible, 
did we do it or not thing, right? That's not something vague, like being better about something or just doing something less or more, but try to be as, as specific as you could be. But I think just to reiterate what we said earlier, it's this idea that like anger can lead to action, to these action points. Like anger can be this indication of like, okay, we need to come up with some kind of action points for a positive change. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a good thing, you know? Like, yeah. and, I, and I think that hopefully that reminder is something that enables people to know like, okay, it is okay to feel it. It is okay to express it because it can lead to action. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, thank you to all of you who joined us today for learning about this. We definitely love to hear from you. We want to know what's your relationship to anger? What has helped you in the past? How has anger come up in your relationships? And how have you found ways to deal with it in a healthy way that's actually helped create productive conversations or create positive change in your relationships? Now, the best place to share your thoughts on this with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. Or you can also leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. Full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com.